So I hope I'll get a clicker for the slides, otherwise it's going to be a little bit boring, at least visually. Um, well, thank you so much, Steffi, and uh, uh, thanks for bringing us all together here at, uh, at DLD once again. Amazing to see you all. Um, what I would like to talk about to, to start the day of, of all these great um, uh, panels and discussions that we're going to have is, uh, I hope, a little bit of a reminder to you, even to myself, to all of us, uh, what has happened in the last year, right? I remember, I remember um, uh, uh, being at a dinner uh, exactly one year ago where uh, someone showed the, uh, the very first AI-generated uh, uh, pictures, right? This is only one year ago, 12 months ago. Um, usually in industry or in any other major events, it makes sense to have a 10-year period to look back at. I think this Cambrian explosion that we're going through here, the speed at which we're going, um, merits a one-year uh, review and then hopefully an outlook of what we think, what I think is going to be next, is going to be hitting us next, all of us actually, all of society, within the next 12, to 12 months to maybe five years. So uh, let's get started and take a look at what happened. AI has been called the mother of all technologies many times, so it only makes sense that it observes the mother of all hockey stick curves, right? So basically it started here with a bunch of guys um, who had a grant to solve the problem of machine intelligence within 10 weeks. That was their mandate. That was back in uh, 1956. Um, and then nothing basically happened for the next 70 odd years, right? Of course things happened, you know, we had machine translation and computers started beating, um, uh, uh, started beating the best player in the world at Go and before that at chess and all these events, but no one really cared in terms of a wider audience, right? You had to be really interested in this. And then within the space of a year, everything happened, right? Absolutely everything happened. You know, it started out with, um, uh, with stable diffusion, uh, or DALI, right, the sort of the, the, the picture generating uh, generative AIs that came out late last summer, um, uh, early fall last year. And then in November, um, you know, it finally kicked into gear with uh, OpenAI releasing ChatGPT to the world. And um, back then, I mean, I put two events here that have happened since. I could have put 10 different ones, but, you know, just to get, to get the significance of this, um, we now have more than one billion end users that have used, that have actively used generative AI products within the space of one year of their first release to the general public. Um, and, and on a conceptual level, um, it's now common wisdom that we've passed the Turing test, right? For those of you who don't know, Turing test is a benchmark uh, developed by, by Alan Turing um, uh, a while ago for machine intelligence that basically says if you cannot differentiate after a 10 or a 15 minute conversation whether the person or not person you're talking to is a machine or not, then we've reached human level intelligence. Now, we haven't reached human level intelligence, but we've passed the Turing test, right? So we definitely need a new, need a new benchmark. But the, those two, I hope, um, you know, tell you how significant the last 12 months have been. Our heads are spinning. We've been thinking about AI for a long, long time at 46A, investing actively in it. And, uh, you know, uh, uh, our heads are spinning. I think everyone's heads are spinning. So let's unpack this a little bit, um, uh, what has happened. So what has happened? Why does this work now at a very high 10,000 feet cruising altitude level? I think you have the holy trinity of three things that came together uh, and that were in the making for a very long time, right? First of all, um, you needed the intelligence layer, right? You needed the algorithms that power all of this, right? And there have been many, many breakthroughs, many, many, you know, people standing on giant shoulders. But I guess the most, um, uh, the most important event is, and this is a typo, uh, which is embarrassing, this should read transformer model, not transfer model. We had the transformer model um, uh, uh, in 2017 and all the architecture uh, um, uh, uh, that was built on top of this. Um, we had massive advances that were needed on the compute side, right? So we changed the architecture uh, to the GPU architecture that is now powering all of AI. Um, and we needed uh, an abundance of data to train these models on, which we have in the open and the deep web uh, uh, available to us, right? And um, all of these three pillars together led to the fact that we can now type in and ask for a picture of the Pope um, uh, in, a, in a white jacket and we get one. So that's on the technology front. 
That has been basically the hockey stick curve that's been developing for all those decades and that's now kicking into gear. Now, second, I guess on the usage front, this is something we very often forget. Why is generative AI, um, you know, on the use case front so interesting now? Well, because for the first time, we're trying to mimic brains with machines. But until now, we've basically been asking them to do very non-human things, which is to be precise with you know, 110% every single time we ask them a task. Now we're changing that. Now we're asking it to produce creative content, which is what the human brain is good at, right? So we allow for errors, we allow for hallucination, we allow for bullshit answers, basically, right? And all of a sudden, the things that we modeled after the brain are actually quite good at that, right? So the generative AI output that we get that amazes all of us is not binary, is not non, you know, zero or one. It's actually something that allows for error and for interpretation or it's iterative, right? When we program, when we ask it, hey, build this type of algorithm in Python or C++ or whatever, and then it gives us an output and an error message, and you as the human look at it and say, no, this is wrong, and you iterate with it, right? So the two things, that are the kind of output we expect, non-binary, but creative or iterative. And I think those factors, the technology uh, uh, triangle and, and the use cases we ask it to, uh, uh, to solve, have led to the fact that now we have it all in place and, uh, and we are where we're at. Now, the big question that we're all asking ourselves, is this hype or is this a new platform, right? We have a very strong take that it's a new platform and this is completely real. This is nothing like anything we've seen in the past. This is no crypto, this is no uh, uh, um, you know, other, other, other fads that we've seen. Um, there are many arguments pro and against it, but I'll give you the one that I find the most convincing um, uh, 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 as to why it's not a hype. I mean, you could say it already generated three business lines with nine to ten digit uh, uh, revenue products, you know, be it uh, coding, be it uh, uh, copywriting, or be it um, uh, creative output in terms of visuals. Um, so we can talk all about, about all those great things that have happened, but basically what I, I find the most convincing is a, is a historical perspective. If you look at the last two big platform shifts that we have seen, yeah, uh, first one, I want to talk about the internet. What was the economic effect of the internet? The economic effect of the internet, as with all big technologies that stick, is not that they give us things that are new, but that they make existing things a lot cheaper, right? If you think about the great innovation of SpaceX, Elon Musk's company, we've been to space before, it's just not going to be a lot cheaper to get things up there, and that's actually true with every big technological shift that sticks. So the internet gave us the cost, or the marginal cost of distribution to zero, right? Our partners, Border, they, they run a big publishing business, they know all about that, right? So that's something that, uh, 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 that stuck. You now can distribute content and many other things at a marginal cost of zero. The second big um, innovation that we were allowed to witness in the last two decades, the cloud. And again, the cloud didn't do new things, it just made existing things a lot cheaper and more convenient, and that's storage, right? So storage now has a marginal cost of zero. And um, it's very clear what's happening with generative AI. You know, the marginal cost of content generation is going to zero. This slide set, as of now, costs you, um, I don't know, 1,000 to 2,000 uh, uh, euros to produce for the designer and takes three days of iterations. Um, I think it's a fair guess once Microsoft releases Copilot, this is going to be for free and instant, right? So we are getting the cost of content generation down to zero. And I think this is the strongest argument, strongest, you know, historical precedent argument as to why we think this is going to last and be big. Now, the big question that a lot of us will be discussing today is who will capture the value? Who's going to make money for this? The value to the consumer we think is perfectly obvious. What's not obvious is who's going to make money from this? And um, the AI stack today is basically built up in three pillars. You have the infrastructure layer, yeah, that's the hardware and the cloud. You have the model layer, and you have the applications. The only thing we know so far is that these guys are going to print money, right? So um, NVIDIA is doing pretty well, and it will be doing for the foreseeable future. Now, the clouds at the moment, yes, but there's going to be so much competition around that it's, it's still hard to find a mode other than the scale, but probably a pretty good chance. But the really interesting thing for us as investors is what's happening in those two layers, right? This is where we all made a lot of money in the last wave, in the internet wave, on the models, on the applications, right? 
you didn't make a lot of money if you owned Deutsche Telekom, you made all the money if you owned WhatsApp that was sitting on top of it, right? So we think right now this might be the other way around, right? So for the first time, we're looking at fat infrastructure versus fat app debate, um, uh, uh, saying that infrastructure might be the one winning this because, and we invest a lot in AI companies, so I hope I'm wrong here, but at the moment, it's very hard to see a long-term inherent moat in those two layers because other than one company having raised a ton more than the other or having five smarter um, uh, 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 professors for a quarter, there is not a lot going on that's inherently a long-term moat here uh, or differentiation, right? So that raises the question, I hope we will find one, but that raises the question is where will value capture uh, happen along this stack? And uh, we'll, we'll see the answer to all those questions. So will we have a few godlike models or will we have many, many small models that sit on devices? Um, we have a big closed source versus open source uh, uh, debate going on. And uh, as I said, we have the fat app versus the fat infrastructure um, uh, debate. Those are the open topics. So we're in the middle of maximum entropy when it comes to that and uh, looking forward to all the debates that will happen later today. Um, I will not leave you without making three predictions about things that I'm more sure about than the value capture. So what will we see in the next one to three years? First of all, we're all getting digital twins, right? So um, if you saw the movie Her, yeah, the guy talking to uh, uh, his, his personal friend uh, on the computer all day long, that'll be us. We'll get personal companions. They're not very far away. The first versions will be released uh, uh, in the next couple of weeks. And these guys will be on 24-7. They'll be incredibly, uh, infinitely patient. They're always helpful. They know you inside out. And you'll probably spend a lot of time talking to them if you like it or not. That's to the inside. What's going to happen to the outside world? You'll get an external digital twin, right? So your social media profile, if you have one, um, uh, 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 um, you know, We'll, we'll, we'll be able to automatically take a picture of you at any beach or in any conference room or wherever, right? Or even videos and whatnot and automatically respond to content that's going on um, uh, around you the way you tell it to. It will answer the emails in your style and all other communications if you want to. So we're getting into a world very quickly, and this is probably the soonest to arrive, um, that we'll have digital twins externally and companions internally to do a lot of our communication work. Um, second, I think so far generative AI has done things that we could do but a lot cheaper and a lot quicker. I think we will now get into content generation that is beyond the human brain, right? So in STEM, I think it's a very conservative assumption that we'll see the first uh, AI-generated uh, Fields Medal or Nobel Prize in the hard sciences within the next five to ten years, right? They will go beyond what our brain is capable of very quickly. In healthcare, probably the biggest market out of all of them, AI augmented diagnostics is already better than the best human doctor, and that will exponentially increase even further. So no question, these guys are going to be better than us, than the best of us. And probably uh, 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 the most visible one is in education, right? Education is not going to be the same anymore. You will have infinitely patient teachers that explain the exact example that you want to know at every level, in every step, uh, in every language, 24-7, around the clock. So tutoring and the entire education market will look nothing like it does today. And finally, last prediction, AI will go 3D, right? Um, by the way, I studied mathematics, and that was the big platform technology of my generation that opened up a lot of job opportunities. I would not recommend that to the next generation. I think our mathematics skills are not going to be that important anymore going forward, at least not as a differentiator uh, on the job market. I think the last prediction I want to make is um, uh, uh, that we're all going 3D, right? So, so far, we've had the models for language and for vision. We're now going into movement, right? So this is important. So far, we've what's known uh, in science language tokenized um, uh, the visual world, and we've tokenized language. Now we're going to tokenize movement, right? and my, my, my previous speaker talked about um, uh, uh, robots and automation a lot, that will be possible a lot cheaper and at scale. We'll be able to tell robots to train robots at marginal cost zero, so it's just um, a pure question of, of building the hardware 
which uh, is a problem in many cases, at least in industrial robotics, that's pretty well solved. So expect an absolute explosion in the deployment of at least industrial robots over the next five years. Yeah, that's where we are. Thank you very much, and I hope we're going to have a great day of discussions. Thank you.